Hello everyone. Last uh, last Wednesday, <laughs> we learned that there are three major tissues that regulate substrate metabolism and energy storage and utilization. We learned that liver and muscle they are responsible for synthesizing glycogen and it's under insulin stimulated conditions in other words after you eat a meal uh, that contains carbohydrate glucose levels increase insulin is released and it stimulates the liver to, to, to restore glucose as glycogen and also the muscle it not only stimulates glucose uptake but also glycogen synthesis so these two organs they are critical for glycogen synthesis that's what we learned so the storage of carbohydrate specifically in the form of glucose because we know that glucose is the only or is the currency that our body uses you may eat different types of carbohydrate but it's the glucose that really matters in the end of the day because that's what your body ultimately uses for energy and also for storage in the form of glycogen and we also learned that the adipose tissue takes up the excess not only glucose and the adipose tissue is also dependent on insulin to uptake glucose so uh, whenever glucose goes up insulin is released the adipose tissue also takes up glucose and we we know that uh, that glucose is important because the uh, the fat cell use that glucose to make glycerol and glycerol is the backbone to sterify fatty acids and make triacylglycerol so that's the way how we store energy there so glucose can be cleared from the circulation by the liver by storing its glycogen by the muscle also by doing that and glucose can also be oxidized of course heart oxidize some of it uh, uh, other organs utilize the brain we learned that uses glucose and the adipose tissue uh, mainly takes anything that is the surplus, anything that is the excess, be it glucose or fat, and store it in the form of triacylglycerol. So now we have a distribution of, of energy in different compartments in the body. So let's understand exactly how much of each of these different uh, energy substrates we actually have available and stored, stored and available in the body. So this table gives us the average body energy stores of a non obese 70 kilogram man so what we have here on the left side is we have the fuel so the type of fuel that we are we are looking at so then we have triacylglycerols we have glycogen we have glucose and we have protein so this these are the different types of fuels that are one way or another is stored present in our bodies and then we have here in the middle this middle column we have the amount that is stored in kilograms and on the far left we have how much this amount is stored in kilograms represents actually in energy in kilocalories so as we can see here triacylglycerols they are mainly the main site of storage is the adipose tissue as we know so if you pinch your skin if you take a skin fold you have your your layer of, of skin that, that protects your body but underneath it you have this layer of fat that we call subcutaneous adipose tissue we also have some fat it's a small proportion that is also uh, around our organs in the intra-abdominal cavity so it provides support it provides uh, energy and also substrate but mainly it provides support and you we have some in a much smaller amount but also inside of our in between the organs to provide support and cushioning to those organs but in terms of energy if we really look at the bulk of the energy that we have stored is in the adipose tissue and on average uh, and this is a, a, a lean man it's not uh, uh, I'm using here a average lean man so approximately 15 kilograms of fat, 15.3. And if you look at that fat, provides approximately 140,000 calories or kilocalories. So there is a 
enormous amount, a huge amount of energy that is stored in the adipose tissue. And, the ad, and, and this is actually the main purpose, one of the main purposes of the fat cell, is to store energy so it can be mobilized whenever necessary. So and again, when you have a positive energy balance condition, you're going to store, so you're going to add more to this uh, compartment, to this adipose tissue, so you actually put up energy or you store energy so you can use it when you're exercising or when you're fasting or if you for some reason you're deprived of food you need to have an alternative source of energy so your body goes and mobilizes that fat that is in the adipose tissue so 140,000 calories just to give you an idea put this in perspective obviously we don't usually don't do this but this is an amount of energy that would be sufficient if we were able to live only on fat this would be a enough for you to or for anyone to survive approximately a month without eating any food just by mobilizing the adipose tissue so the amount of energy there just gives us an idea of how much energy is actually available there and it's almost pure fat because you have very little water because fat as as you remember is a hydrophobic hydrophobic molecule so what happens is that when you store it you you store it mainly in a very concentrated form and with very little water so you can pack up a lot of energy taking the minimum amount of space possible because this is where almost entirely uh, uh, the cell is taken up almost entirely by a big fat droplet made up of, of triglycerides so that gives you an idea of how much energy we actually have available in the adipose and this is again this is an average lean person it's not I'm not even talking about someone who is obese or overweight or obese because this could easily double or triple depending on what kind of 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 or the degree of obesity that we are relating here so now let's look at the other compartment that is glycogen so if you look at in muscle and liver muscle we have putting all together all the glycogen in the muscle we have approximately 350 grams and liver another 100 grams so all together muscle and liver we have approximately 450 to 500 grams of of glycogen and that gives us approximately 1800 to 2000 calories so if you look at the difference between how much energy you have stored in fat versus how much you have stored in glycogen it's it's so much less i mean glycogen is or glucose is a very important substrate is a very versatile sub, sub, substrate because you can use it for different purposes but you cannot store much you can only store a limited amount we are going to see next why this is the case so your body usually tries to spare glycogen and use as much as possible fat as an alternative source of energy so that gives you an idea why is it's important for you to maintain or to spare as much glucose as possible because you cannot store much you can make fresh glucose through gluconeogenesis and your liver does that quite well but you cannot store much so look at the, the glucose if we were to take all the glucose that is in your in your blood circulating in your blood is approximately 12 grams which gives you quickly 50 gram 50 calories or kilocalories so it's a very small amount of glucose that is available normally in the circulation and this is obviously in the post prandial period when you don't sorry in the post absorptive period when you are not uh, when you have already cleared all the glucose that came from a from a meal for instance so if you measure your 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 fasting blood glucose and you were to calculate how much glucose you have available in your blood you would have approximately 12 grams of glucose and gives you roughly 50 kilocalories so again we have limited supply limited capacity to store glycogen and muscle and liver and it gives you approximately 1800 to 2000 calories and some of this glucose is used to maintain blood glucose levels because what the liver does is as if your glucose t goes down because you're you're exercising for instance or if you're if you're fasting and your cells in your body is using glucose for energy for instance or for other purposes uh, uh, it tends to uh, your glycemia tends to go down 
So, but it doesn't. Normally, he stays within a very narrow range, and this is because uh, liver releases glucose into the circulation, so it maintains. It uses largely this this 100 grams of glucose that is stored in the liver is used pretty much to maintain or sustain a normal or a, 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 a stable glycemia throughout the day in under different conditions. So we have again, I think the most important thing, limited supply, and we have to maintain it re relatively constant. We also have protein, and protein is mostly in muscle. And remember, we, we, we mentioned that protein is a product of muscle, skeletal muscle, which is not only protein, but there is a large component that is protein. In this person here, the 70 kilogram man, is approximately 10 kilograms of protein is stored in different muscles. But again, your, our body does not really mobilize much protein. You have to be in a very restrictive situation for long, long periods of time for you to really break down the muscle and take the protein to, for gluconeogenesis to make glucose. But normally we have, uh, we, we, your body also spares it because it's the structure, it's your body. You're not going to destroy your structure in order to make glucose. It can do this, but it, it does, it limits as, or it, it, it spares as much as possible uh, protein. And again, what is the, what is the go-to substrate? Always fat because you have an abundance of energy stored in the adipose tissue. So your body is always trying to use more fat and it spared this glucose for sure and also protein because it makes up your structure. You don't want to destroy it to provide glucose. So your body really uh, only uses or only goes into the muscle to break it down when you are in a very restrictive condition for a very long period of time and there is no other way out. So you pretty much exhaust the other alternatives and then your, your muscles become a, a contributor or an important contributor to, uh, to the maintenance of whole body energy homeostasis. So again, we wanna spare, well, we wanna be able to use as much as possible fat because it's in a lean person, we have lots of energy, spare glucose, Spare protein, use it, maintain it to or use it to maintain basic functions of the body, and alternatively use fat. The difference is that fats you can only if you want to produce energy, you can only do this by aerobic metabolism. And if you remember this from your basic physiology and basic biochemistry classes, you learn that fat needs to be you need to mobilize fat from the adipose tissue, so then fatty acids circulate in the blood, go to the muscle, for instance, or go to the liver. And then those fatty acids enter the cell, enter the mitochondria, and inside of the mitochondria has to be oxidized in the Krebs cycle. So again, you need to have, the more mitochondria you have, and the, the higher your aerobic capacity, the more fat you can mobilize. So, but it's the only way that your fat can be used to produce energy. Glucose is different because glucose is, when I said that it's versatile, it's versatile because you can really mobilize, you can uh, produce energy from, from glucose using anaerobic metabolism, classical glycolysis that you learned, and in the byproduct of that pathway is usually lactate. But also in a, in a well-trained system or in a, in, a, in, a, in a muscle, for instance, or in a cell that contains uh, lots of mitochondria and the oxidative capacity is high, that glucose now can be converted, instead of going into lactate, it can be converted into pyruvate, and pyruvate into acetyl-CoA, and then it enters the Krebs cycle and can also produce energy. Uh, can also be oxidized and produce energy by aerobic metabolism. So uh, glucose is, is very dynamic in that aspect because you can produce energy in different ways. Fat doesn't give you that luxury. Fat is only through aerobic metabolism. So that's why there are some, you have an abundance of energy for, in fat, but you have some limitations in how your body is able to, to, to process it. Glucose, you have limited supply, but it can be very versatile, can be used in different ways. And again, because our body is limited in, in the supply of, of glycogen or in the storage and the capacity to store glycogen, it spares it, but also if it goes down too much, you get hungry again. And this is another system and another mechanism by which your body can actually sense, 
can also respond to blood glucose levels. So if your glycemia goes down drastically, you become hungry. And this is one of the conditions also that is typical in the type 1 diabetes because they don't have insulin, so they cannot use glucose. Even though they have lots of glucose, but the brain interprets as if there was not enough glucose in the system. So what it, what it triggers is hunger. So type 1 diabetic patients, they usually have, they're, they're constantly hungry. Unless, obviously, when they're treated with insulin, insulin suppresses it. So they, it's a satiety hormone now. So insulin kind of suppresses hunger. But when insulin is down, and glucose levels, because glucose levels went down, then the brain senses it and also responds by promoting <clears throat> hunger. So you seek food. Again, this is another mechanism by which your body <clears throat> regulates energy metabolism, food intake and energy metabolism, based on the availability of specific substrates. So this table pretty much kind of uh, uh, characterizes the different compartments that store energy in our body. So summarizing this, the, what, what I'm saying here in this slide is that there is versatility and essentiality of glucose. When I say versatility, I mean that glucose can be used to generate energy through anaerobic and anaerobic pathways. And also, for instance, one example is when, you've trans when you transition from low to high intensity exercise. Let's say you are, <clears throat> you are running or you're jogging on a, on a flat surface. And you're, you've been jogging for, uh, you are doing this in a, at a sub-maximal intensity. Let's say you're like 70, 80% of your heart rate. Uh, so you're below, it's a sub-maximum intensity of exercise. So your body is actually oxidizing uh, uh, fat and also a little bit of glucose. But then you, all of a sudden, you're, you're running on a flat surface. But then you've, you've, you, you, you have to go up a hill. So if you... If, as long as, as as soon as you start climbing that hill, the intensity of exercise goes up. And because the intensity increases, you have to shift quickly to a substrate that can easily or quickly provide energy and supply <clears throat> the additional energy demand for going uphill. So that transition from low to high intensity exercise is always uh, possible because you can mobilize quickly mobilize glucose inside of the muscle cell or glycogen inside of the muscle cell and that provides you that additional energy so you can switch you can increase intensity of exercise without uh, stopping or you, you, you are allow your it, 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 you are able to actually switch from different intensities from low to high low to high if you were to do let's like, say interval training or any, some other kind of activity where you you do a uh, and you are at an easy pace, at a low intensity, uh, exercise intensity, and then all of a sudden you climb or you, you, you increase the speed or the intensity or how much effort you put per unit of time. So that switch, that additional energy that is required comes from glucose. <clears throat> so that's when I say that it's versatile or versatility is referred to the ability of your body to use glucose in different conditions. It, it, it can be for under aerobic conditions and also anaerobic conditions, <clears throat> which you cannot do with fat. Fat, it, it provides a steady amount of energy, but it has to be, it's limited in how quick you can actually mobilize and how much energy it contributes per unit of time. So you have an almost endless amount of energy in the, in the fat cell, but you need to be able to take it out send it to the circulation, get into the muscles, and then, or in the liver, in different organs, and then you can little by little process that fat and ge generate energy by aerobic metabolism. Glucose is different because, again, it can quickly shift, it can be quickly mobilized even in, within the muscle cell, and either through aerobic or anaerobic uh, processes. <clears throat> and the other side is essentiality. Essentiality means that Certain types of cells in our body can only rely on glucose for energy. So they are essential from the point of view not that you cannot produce. It's essential from the point of view that cells, specific cells in our body can only survive on glucose. We learned that it's the case of erythrocytes or red blood cells. And we also learned that the kidney or the medulla 
or the core area of the kidney, specific portions of the medulla of the kidney, only uses glucose. And for that reason, it's essential for that particular, those cells or those organs to function normally. Again, don't confuse essentiality with the idea that we, we spoke before in the beginning of the course when we said that some nutrients are considered essential because we cannot produce, so we have to get from the diet. That's not the case here. When I say essentiality, here's because some cells can only live on glucose. Our body can produce it, so it's not a, an essential nutrient, but for the function of particular cells, it's essential because that cell can only survive on glucose. So I also have here the brain. I included the brain here. <clears throat> and the reason for this is that because the brain can survive without glucose. And this is an important thing. Normally, because we have a diet that is very rich in carbohydrate, our body obviously prefers to use glucose as a source of energy. So on average, on a typical diet that contains quite a bit of carbohydrate, usually about... 60 to 50 to 60 percent carbohydrate coming from the diet you always have a steady or like a large supply of glucose so the brain becomes or gives preference to glucose so in under these conditions the brain uses approximately 120 grams of glucose per day so it can be very quick processed by the brain now if you deprive your or if you limit the supply of glucose from the diet and your glycemia is maintained constant, but also your brain adjusts or adapts to use an alternative source of energy, which is ketones body, ketone bodies. So these ketones, they come from the metabolism of fat. So brain does not use fat or fatty acids for energy, but your liver converts fatty acids into ketones. Ketones can travel through the blood into the brain and the brain can easily use ketones. So glucose and ketones are the two substrates that the brain uses for energy. Normally, again, on a regular diet, because we have plenty of glucose available, your body does not even need to use fatty acids and produce ketones. So you, you have plenty, of, and brain prefers to use glucose. Again, approximately 120 grams of glucose per day. Now, if you deprive or if you reduce or you cut from carbohydrate from your diet, then your body will convert uh, fat into ketones and your body will also be able to use those. So again, glucose is a very important substrate uh, that participates in this regulation of metabolism because it, it regulates, it, it has an important role in regulate satiety and hunger. It also has an important role in regulating or providing energy to, this, to different organs and tissues. And some of them, they rely essentially on, on glucose. So for that reason, they are essential for that purpose. So glucose is a very versatile and essential with some features of essentiality in terms of how it provides energy to different organs and tissues. Now, why is it? And I mentioned before, so I want to I wanna now make that explain why. So we said that we have limited capacity to store glycogen. We cannot, we only have approximately 1,800 to 2,000 calories in glucose in our body. So why is that? Why can't we store, instead of storing energy as fat, why don't we store more energy as glycogen? Because if glycogen is such versatile, if it, there is a certain, it's such a dynamic substrate that can be used by different organs and tissues. So why don't we store more? So the reason for this is because every time that you store, and I think I mentioned this before, every time you store one gram of glycogen, you store three to four grams of water. So it's a one to three to one to four ratio with water. So again, for this, uh, uh, amount of glycogen that we spoke before, okay, that we have in this table, for this approximately, let's say 400, 450 to 500 grams of glucose, if you do a one, two, three, you're going to have 1.5 grams, or 1.5 kilograms of water that comes along with this, with this glycogen. If you go with four, it's even more because you're going to have four, uh, 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 two, uh, two kilograms of mus of, of water plus 500 grams, four to 500 grams of, of, of glycogen. So you cannot store too much 
glycogen because it has a very close relationship with water. So it's a 1 to 3 to 1 to 4 ratio. You cannot store, let's say if you were to store 15, the same amount that we store in fat, let's say 15 kilograms of fat in, in glycogen, in the form of glycogen. So 15 kilograms of, of, gly of glycogen would have to, you would have, let's say, three times that in water. So you would have just in water 45 kilograms along with this 15 kilograms of, 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 of glycogen if you were to store this. So obviously it's not viable. Human beings w wouldn't be able to function with that. You would have just by glycogen and, and, and water, if you were to substitute all the fat f for glycogen, you would have that alone would be 45 plus 15, you would have 60 kilograms just for that particular comp component. So obviously it doesn't make sense and it's not possible. It's not sustainable. It's not compatible with the with life the way we know as human beings are made up. So skeletal muscles plus liver, is, uh, if glycogen is stored in skeletal muscle plus liver, would be enough to sustain approximately a 2.5 grams per minute rate of glucose oxidation, which is enough to support approximately 1 to 0.5 to 2 hours of exercise. If you were, again, now if we were, if we were to, to do the opposite kind of thinking here, if you thought that uh, let's say we are going to rely essentially only on glucose. We are not going to use any fat for to supplement energy or to provide energy to, to muscles. If we're only using glycogen, we would be able to sustain exercise for approximately 1.5 to 2 hours, not much longer than that. And that's also the reason why athletes usually uh, drink uh, solutions that contain carbohydrate. So the idea is that as you, 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 you exercise, especially if you're running a marathon or if you're a triathlete or if you're doing some kind of activity that lasts more than one and a half, two hours, you're going to end up depleting your glycogen. You're going to really suffer because your, the intensity of exercise is going to drop quite, quite a bit. So what people usually do, especially athletes that, that compete in these long distance races, what they do is they all also take in or they ingest some kind of liquid solution that contains carbohydrate. And the idea is that as you deplete your glycogen, your endogenous glycogen content, you, you kind of bring in more by taking in uh, 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 solutions that bring in exogenous glucose. You kind of replace that glycogen that is being used for energy as exercise uh, is, is uh, uh, sustained. So this also explains why marathon runners, runners often, often, often display signs of fatigue after 30 Ks. Because if, if a marathon is approximately 42 Ks, usually, uh, on average, if you, by the time you reach that 30 K mark, you are approximately, you're about one, to one and a half to two hour time. So that is the length of time when Glycogen, muscle glycogen and liver glycogen is pretty much depleted. So then what happens is that the ability to sustain the intensity of exercise is drastically limited. So marathon runners, they often display signs of fatigue after 30 Ks in a race. And, and usually, again, coinciding with muscle glycogen depletion. So again, it's important that you start a race with plenty of glycogen in your muscles. So that's why we do where the carbo loading idea comes into play because what you're doing is you're providing you're starting a race with as much glycogen as you can stored in your muscle and liver and then what happens is that as the exercise is 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 prolonged you're gonna deplete some of that and therefore not only you do a, a loading phase prior to the race but you also use or make use of some solution that replaces carbohydrate during the race so you minimize the impact on glycogen depletion in the skeletal muscle so you the athlete may be able to tolerate a higher intensity of exercise and in a race obviously the person who runs faster is the winner so who runs faster is that person who can sustain a higher intensity of exercise for a longer period of time so again this is where Basically, all this idea of carbo-loading and supplementing uh, uh, 
consuming glycogen uh, glu solutions that contain carbohydrate during exercise come from. It's a well-known idea. And finally, for us to complete this idea of substrate, how substrate works, you're going to find in some books this kind of say, fat burns in the flame of carbohydrate. What do I mean by this? Uh, in order for you to be able to effectively burn fat in a, in a mitochondria, you need to have all the components of the oxidative pathway inside of the mitochondria. So what happens is that is if you deplete your glycogen, you start cannibalizing or you start using some of those components of the, of the oxidative pathway. Because the mitochondria, inside of the mitochondria, you have actually it's a little bag full of enzymes. Those enzymes can be used to make glucose. So in a condition where you have excessive depletion of glucose because either you're not eating enough, you're not being supplied with glucose, or because there is some uh, 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 depletion uh, through exercise, for instance, or for, through fasting or, or starvation, what happens is that your body starts to use those enzymes inside of the mitochondria that make up, for instance, the Krebs cycle to make glucose. So what happens is that you are stealing those enzymes from the mitochondria. So what happens is that you cannot effectively burn fat because fat will burn and you need those enzymes. So if you're lacking those enzymes, you have fat, plenty of fat coming, but you cannot oxidize it. So that's why some people use this and you're going to probably see this in, 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 in textbooks saying that fat burns in flame of carbohydrate. So why, 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 why am I mentioning this? Why am I mentioning this? Is so you, you, you have an idea of the, the interdependence of these different types of substrate because, again, those enzymes, what does those, why, why is it that those enzymes, uh, uh, why do we need glucose for those enzymes to be present? Because some of those enzymes that are present or those components, no, it's not necessarily enzymes here, those intermediary of the Krebs cycle, intermediaries, molecules that make up the Krebs cycle, they come from the metabolism of glucose. So if you deplete glucose, you cannot replace those intermediates of Krebs cycle. So you lose them. When you lose them, you cannot actually, you're not able, you lose the capacity to effectively burn fat. But again, this is in under very extreme conditions where you either are not eating enough for a long period of time or you drastically deplete your glycogen levels when you combine, for instance, starvation with exercise, conditions that uh, are extreme. Most of the case, this, is, this doesn't happen because you have plenty of carbohydrate available and you, you never lose those intermediate or intermediates of the Krebs cycle inside of the mitochondria. So again, and this also justifies for athletes, it's another reason why athletes usually do carbohydrate loading, because the idea is that they are going to fill up your, your tank as much as possible with glycogen. So it takes longer. It makes it more difficult for you to deplete. And obviously, the better, the higher the oxidative capacity that you have, more fat you're going to use, more carbohydrate you're going to spare, more glycogen you're going to spare. So good athletes, well-trained athletes, especially marathon runners or this one, that are the athletes that are trained in aerobic events, they have such a high oxidative capacity that they use mostly fat and they spare as much as possible glycogen. For that reason, they can last long, they can run fast, and those are usually the best marathon runners that you, you see. Okay, guys, with this, I think we pretty much finished all the content that is going to be uh, used for the exam. So we are not going to, this is the last part of this, or the, the, the last slide covering material for the exam. So this pretty much ends the course. We could obviously make an entire course based on specific portions of this course, but the idea of this of the of this uh, of Kin 4020 is to give you an overview of everything so you have a very good understanding of general aspects of nutrition and metabolism so with this last slide we are going to finish the course what i'm going to do is for monday which is a the actual the last day of class 
I'm going to have a Q&A session so we can I'm gonna be available for you the same as like we did before the two other Q&A sessions we had so what I'm gonna do is just be available for you guys to ask any questions you have to clarify any any doubts or any issue you can go through any things that that maybe may require some clarification because from on the 21st of April we are gonna have the final exam so Monday the 12th is our last meeting and that will be a I'm reserving that day for a Q&A session so with this we're going to stop today thanks for watching and I'll see you on Monday for the Q&A session bye now